Good morning. It's great to be with you this morning for the online worship service of the Pleasant Grove Church of Christ. It's a wonderful opportunity for me to be able to share the gospel message with you in your homes. A few quick announcements before we get started this morning. If you would like to help support the ministry of the Pleasant Grove Church of Christ in southeast Minnesota, you can do so by sending either your tithes or your offerings to the address on the screen beside me. You can also find this address on PleasantGroveChurchOfChrist.com, along with much, much more. We'd love for you to take a look at this website and see what there is to, for you to help build you up in your faith. The other day, we were at the park with my son Davey. He was climbing on a ladder to get to a higher platform. And Now, if you haven't been to a park recently, these ladders that they have these days, they really don't resemble much of ladders at all. Instead, they arch, they twist, they turn. Really what they do is they make it extremely difficult for a two-and-a-half-year-old to climb up anywhere. Needless to say, Davy was trying to climb this arching ladder at the park when out of his lips came a single word. Tricky. Tricky. He knew that that ladder was tricky. What I knew was that Annie and I use the word tricky quite often. We have to be careful about the words that we choose to use. And for that matter, what we do around our children. Because they will probably become just like us for better or for worse. I was thinking about the influence my parents had on me. When I was in high school and you know, thinking about what to do for college, my parents encouraged me to do at least one year at a Bible college in preparation to attend a secular university later. And when I graduated, that's what I did. Except... I enjoyed Bible college so much that I decided to do all my entire degree there. Be careful what you wish for. My parents never intended to have a preacher in the family, but that's just what they got. And now they don't know what to do with him. It wasn't just their encouragement to attend Bible college that led me into the ministry, though. While I was in the midst of school, there was something else that pointed me in that direction. I overheard my dad proudly talking about his two sons. He said, one of my sons saves lives. My brother at the time was in the medical field. And the other saves souls. When I heard the pride in his voice about his two sons, I started considering my going into full-time ministry, making that a goal of my life. And after a few other influencing moments, I chose to enter into the ministry. There have also been moments that have helped me stay in ministry. This past September was one of those moments. My brother and I were both speaking at a camp retreat. I had spoken on Saturday morning, and my brother was up on Saturday evening. And when he got up to speak, he talked about how nervous he was. And in fact, he made it very clear that he was not preaching a sermon, but rather merely facilitating a discussion. After clarifying that, he said what I never thought I would hear him say. He gave his little punk brother a compliment. In fact, perhaps the best compliment a minister could possibly hear. He said that every time he has heard me speak, he has come away with a new perspective on God's word and has been challenged to live differently. What an amazing compliment. At the time, 
at a time when I was struggling, his encouraging words gave me the strength to press on. Today, we'll be looking at Mary's song in Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 55. The way we view Mary, the mother of Jesus, is oftentimes polarized. We either see her as some sort of icon of the faith, or as merely a passing reference in the story of Christ. But could it be that neither view is quite right? As we read the verses of Mary's song, I want us to recognize that her humility, coupled with her faith, is an example worth our emulating. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, holy, is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Notice how she sang of the monumental events of history. The Lord has performed mighty deeds. He has scattered the proud, fed the hungry, sent the rich away empty helped his people remembering what he had promised to their forefathers. Our minds might wander to God's deliverance of his people from captivity, the plagues and the parting of the Red Sea, how he crushed the proud in the midst of turbulent waters, how he fed his people in the wilderness for all those years that they wandered and how he drove out those who were in the promised land before them, thus fulfilling his promise he made to Abraham centuries earlier. God was in control even when life seemed out of control. God is in control. And that's how God is. Even when life is confusing, when it seems to be falling apart, when we're in distress, God is still in control. What a message for us today in our turbulent modern world. With so many question marks, medically, racially, politically, what should we do? Trust. Trust that God is still in control. He has been and he always will be. If God's control of monumental events of history were all that Mary mentioned in her song, that alone would be significant to our modern world. But before she ever turned her attention to God's control of worldwide events, she sang of his control of the seemingly insignificant events in her life. Perhaps not insignificant to her, but seemingly insignificant to the world at large. A census, a journey, an innkeeper, a stable, some shepherds, a few wise men, a jealous king, and an escape. On and on the list of seemingly insignificant events goes in Mary's life. There at the very beginning of her list, an appearance of an angel and a commitment to be used of God. 
Mary trusted that God was not only in control of the on a grand scale, but also in control of the minor events of her seemingly insignificant life. Here's the thing. Though we may sometimes think of Mary as insignificant, just a minor character mentioned in the birth story of Christ, a vessel to be used of God for his purpose, God saw her as significant. Through this young girl, God would bring about the most monumental event in human history. God changed everything. In a moment, he saw the significance of a single choice, a single choice to trust that he is in control. With just a few words spoken in trust, he was able to do great things, even with the insignificant. I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, May your word to me be fulfilled. Luke chapter 1, verse 38. And with her commitment, God transformed the entirety of human history. No longer are we forever separated from his presence, but God became one of us. He became the son of Mary. All of history was transformed in a moment of trust that God is in control. This past week, I was visiting with some friends about the significance of a moment. Both of them, in turn, shared how a single moment had changed the path of their life. One, the suggestion of his grandfather that his parents make church a priority for their family. The other, a passing comment following a short-term missions presentation. Both are serving the Lord, influencing countless others because of their seemingly insignificant moment. My question for you this morning is this. What difference can an insignificant moment in your life make when you give control of it to God? A word of encouragement given, a card sent, a visit shared. God can transform the world in a moment, even one that is seemingly insignificant. My challenge for you is to look for an opportunity this week to use your sphere of influence to build someone up, trusting that God is in control and is able to do great things even with just a moment. In that moment, you may just change the world for God. This brings us to a time of communion, a time to share together with with Christ and to share together with one another. In preparation, as you get your, your juice and your bread that you'll share during this time of the Lord's Supper, I'd like to read a passage of scripture also from Luke today. Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 38. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, 
Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. I think it's important for us as followers of Christ, especially at this time of the year as we remember his birth, that we remember that Christ has come to redeem. As the prophet Anna mentions he is looking they were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem he would be the the salvation of both the israelites and the rest of the world at the time of his birth this may not have been as obvious to those around him. It says that his parents marveled at what Simeon had told them. It wasn't obvious the way that that Jesus would be the Messiah, the Christ, the one who would take away the sins of the world. But that was just who he was. He would lay his life down, bringing salvation, bringing forgiveness of our sins. And today we remember that sacrifice of Jesus that we might share in this time together with him. That we might come into the presence of his Father, redeemed made new. And so today, as we remember the sacrifice of Christ, we take of the bread, the bread that represents Jesus' broken body. And of the juice, which represents his shed blood on the cross for our sins, bringing us back into relationship with God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we are able to share in this time of communion together with your Son, Jesus, and with one another around this world as we all partake in remembrance of Jesus' sacrifice there on the cross. And Father, we thank you that because of his sacrifice, because of the forgiveness that is found there, 
that we can come into your presence today and lift up our praises and our prayers, our petitions before you. We thank you that that you cared for us, that you felt that we were important enough to become like us, to join us in our lives, in our successes and our suffering, as we've talked about in weeks past. Father, we thank you that you became the son of Mary, becoming like us, becoming one of us, that Christ would be able to bring salvation into our lives. Now, Father, we ask that we would not only remember his sacrifice, remember Mary, his mother, and the significance of the seemingly insignificant moments, but, Father, that we would be able to utilize our own insignificant moments to change the world as we trust that you can do that, as we trust that you are in control and can work through us to reach those around us for Christ. Now, Father, we pray all these things in your Son's name, Jesus. Amen. I thank you once again for the opportunity to be with you this morning to be able to share in this time of worship together with you and to be able to share the message of Christ with you today. I thank you. I look forward to when we're able to share in this moment again, either in person at the Pleasant Grove Church of Christ in Southeast Minnesota at 10 a.m. each Sunday morning or online at 11 a.m as we did today. We thank you for that opportunity, and I pray that God will bless you and that he will keep you well. We'll see you next time. (music) 